My name is Mrs. Schertz, and I'm going to go over topics 1.4 and 1.5 from the course and exam description for AP Environmental Science about the carbon and nitrogen cycles. So our learning goal or our learning target, I can explain the steps and reservoir interactions in the carbon cycle. That one comes from the course and exam description. Okay, so first of all, we need to understand what are biogeochemical cycles. So biogeochemical, biogeochemical cycles are your interactions of matter through the living things, biological, geological is things in the earth, sometimes non-living, and chemical processes. So the different places that the, the matter, the um, atoms and compounds move through are called reservoirs. And the carbon cycle in particular moves through the atmosphere and biosphere. So biosphere is the living parts of the earth. Okay, so in AP Environmental Science, you have to know four cycles. Some of them should be review if you have had chemistry or if you have had um, biology. Uh, you should be able to know the carbon cycle pretty well. You should know the nitrogen cycle. And phosphorus cycle is new in AP Environmental Science, so that's our new one. The hydrologic cycle is a fancy way of saying the water cycle. Here's some other terms to know. Source is a process that releases matter. A sink is where matter is stored over long periods of time and in large quantities. And reservoirs is area where materials or matter is stored and can move in and out of. And we'll talk about what these things are as we go through the cycles, but I needed you to understand these definitions first. Okay, so our next learning objective, I can explain the steps and reservoir interactions in the carbon cycle. So I'm not going to always read these learning objectives, just pay attention to them as you go through the presentation to fill out a study guide or a reading guide. Okay, so in the carbon cycle, our sources of carbon are cellular respiration. So remember from biology that we, as people, we are consumers. We breathe out carbon dioxide. We do cellular respiration. Plants also do cellular respiration, so they also release carbon dioxide. They mostly do photosynthesis, but they also do a little bit of cellular respiration. So plants can do cellular respiration. When you decompose plants and animals and all living things, fungus included, um, they die and are decomposed. That releases carbon and burning fossil fuels. Okay, some places that store carbon are the ocean. So carbon is stored in the ocean deep at the bottom in our sediments. It's also stored dissolved in the water. So there's a lot of dissolved carbon dioxide in water and dissolved carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid, so that's another way carbon is stored in the ocean. It's also in the atmosphere at carbon dioxide and other, so mostly carbon dioxide, but we also have some other carbon components that are gases like methane is CH4, carbon monoxide is CO, and then living things, we have, we are basically made out of carbon. Okay, some longer term places that store carbon is rocks. So the largest amount of carbon is stored in our sedimentary rocks, and that's also part of the sediments at the bottom of the ocean. Coal, trees, the ocean, those are all considered reservoirs of carbon. Carbon sequestration is when carbon, it's the process of carbon being captured and stored. For example, as trees grow, carbon monoxide carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is actually turned into its biomass. And so the carbon is actually stored in their biomass um, through the process of making sugars or fibers or parts of the tree. Actually, most of the carbon is stored in the trunk of a tree. Now, oceans do this as well. Most of our oxygen on the planet is made by photosynthesizers like phytoplankton. Now, soils can also store carbon as well. We have short-term sinks, trees, algal blooms. So when algae reproduce a lot, because they have a lot of nutrients, they will take in a lot of carbon from the atmosphere, but it's not long-lived. And then we also have soil. Now soil is a temporary storage. Now we have some longer-term storage of carbon. For example, our fossil fuels, coal, petroleum oil, and natural gas, they store carbon for millions of years until they're burned by humans. 
Sedimentary rock and sediments in the ocean, ocean water, and the atmosphere all store carbon for longer periods of time. And let me fix my spelling on atmosphere. Okay, next one. So we have here us photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Make sure you know these equations in terms of inputs and outputs. So for the AP exam, you won't need to know 6CO2 plus 6H2O, give you C6H12O6, etc. But you need to know that carbon and carbon dioxide and water go in as an input or a reactant in photosynthesis, and plants and other producers create glucose and oxygen as our outputs or products. So we have our reactants, our inputs, we have our products, which are our outputs. And you also need to know cellular respiration. Sugar, oxygen are our reactants. Our products are carbon dioxide, water, and energy. It's really, really important that you get these things in your head because we're going to apply these things in lots of ways in our course. Okay, you need to understand also that, well, we just talked about it, plants and algae and phytoplankton, for that matter, use photosynthesis to convert carbon dioxide into water, glucose, and oxygen. Then organisms use part of that carbon and release, um, I'm sorry, organisms use their portion of carbon including us. So we are an organism. We're going to use some carbon and we're going to um, release it through aerobic respiration. Then also in the carbon cycle, we have carbon movement in what's called sedimentation, um, where carbon dioxide in the ocean is used to make calcium carbonate. And so we have carbon moving in and out of living things in the ocean, etc. Now, if the inputs of carbon are equal to the outputs, we have what's called steady state. And so we have here some examples. If you've got five pieces of carbon moving in, but 10 coming out, that's not in steady state. But if you have 10 in and 10 out, that is a steady state. And this would be like atmosphere, this part, this would be a steady state too. And so what we have in the world right now is we are not in steady state since the Industrial Revolution. When we started digging up fossil fuels and burning them, we are no longer in steady state. So before the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s, human beings, but not just us, all the animals on the planet, all the producers on the planet pretty much had our equal um, inputs and outputs of carbon in steady state, but since we now take that saved carbon stored in fossil fuels and we burn it, we are not in steady state. So you do need to know what that term means. So fossil fuels are part of the carbon cycle and they were formed from decomposition of ancient living things. Have you ever heard that gasoline is made from dinosaurs? Well, it's actually more like plankton it creates a petroleum oil, which is turned into gasoline. Um, and so what you have here is you have buried organic matter, that's living things that died and were buried, and you have heat, I'm sorry, you have pressure and time. Millions of years of pressure create different types of um, fossil fuels. So you can kind of see how coal is made here. Now we, as humans, can take those fossil fuels and burn them, and so we don't have a steady state right now, and so we talked about that. You need to know what the word extraction is. That means getting it out of the ground, whether you're mining for coal or you're pumping gasoline or you're mining tar sands. So there's gonna be a lot of things that we're gonna discuss in unit six when we study energy of how to extract the fossil fuels. Combustion means burning. So we burn those fossil fuels in our cars, in um, our power plants so that we can turn on our lights and all other kinds of ways. Okay, so with the added combustion of carbon instead of storage, so being out of steady state, the atmosphere absorbs more heat because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It's the world's most abundant greenhouse gas. And so 
This addition of carbon dioxide means that we have higher surface temperatures and global warming. Now this is a the in, kind of introduction. We'll touch on it a little bit here and there throughout the course and then really understand most of the science in Unit 9. Okay, so the carbon cycle does have natural things. So our cycles are not always human cost. So in the carbon cycle, we have natural portions of the carbon cycle and then we have humans and when humans do something is called anthropogenic so natural things are photosynthesis and cellular respiration volcanoes when they erupt they emit a lot of gases including carbon dioxide natural decomposition and then trees sequester which means they take in carbon and store it because co2 is turned into um, our biomass storage in our plants trees and then photosynthesis by algae and phytoplankton, where most of the world's photosynthesis happens, you're going to store that carbon in the ocean. Now, we have anthropogenic ways that humans influence the carbon cycle. Um, burning fossil fuels, deforestation, and burning that wood. So deforestation, when you cut down the trees, there's two things that happen. First, um, if you just build with it or use the wood for something else and you don't burn it, then you've basically stopped carbon sequestration. So those trees are not alive to keep taking in carbon. But then if you burn the, that wood, you're taking that stored carbon in that tree and you're releasing it back into the atmosphere. Okay, so carbon dioxide in the water can be buffered through, um, the actions of limestone, calcium carbonate um, in lakes. So if your limestone is a type of rock, it's a type of sedimentary rock. And if your, um, so limestone is a sedimentary rock that can be found um, under lakes and wetlands and things. And it's made of calcium carbonate and it can help buffer, so reduce pH change in water due to carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide produces carbonic acid so it can make your body of water more acidic however there are some ecosystems that have a lot of limestone and so the impacts of that acid are not as high we'll also study this when we study acid rain in unit seven okay so we have now our nitrogen cycle the major, major reservoir and sinks of nitrogen cycle are the atmosphere. So the largest reservoir is the atmosphere with 78% of the atmosphere being nitrogen gas. Now soils and other living things like us can contain nitrogen. We have it. Um, think of our DNA as nitrogenous bases, but we don't keep it for a long period of time. Nitrogen is used by plants the nitrogen's in the soil, the plants use it and put it up in their biomass. We can eat the plants and then get our nitrogen that way. So if living things like plants grow and die and are eaten or decompose, they can put nitrogen back into the soil. I already told you that nitrogen is a building block in our body, not just DNA, but proteins as well but it is also a limiting nutrient. So if you remember from biology, a limiting nutrient is, or a limiting factor is something in an ecosystem that limits a population size at its carrying capacity. And so limiting factors can be food, water, shelter, predators, disease, nutrients, all of those things can limit. And so nutrients can limit how many plants can grow in an area and nitrogen is a nutrient. So there's three main nutrients for our producers, our macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. We'll learn that later in unit four. Okay, nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen cycle, um, the cycle itself allows for the movement of nitrogen around the living things, our biosphere and our sources and our sinks. Again, you need to know it's 98% nitrogen, the atmosphere is. You need to know some terms. So it's just some straight up memorization of these things for the nitrogen cycle. So nitrogen fixation is where we take nitrogen gas from the atmosphere and we turn it into a form that plants can use. So plants and algae and phytoplankton can't use N2 gas, it's super stable. So nitrogen fixation can take it and turn it into something usable um, ammonia is usable. It's not as usable as they would like. 
So the next process is ammonia into nitrites and nitrates. That's nitrification, so that's our next term here. And plants prefer nitrates to absorb into their bodies, or take up, it's not really absorb, it's take up into their bodies. Nitrogen fixation can happen in a few ways. It can happen on the roots of legumes. A legume is like a bean or a pea, clover is a legume even. Um, on the roots of the legumes, there are nodules that contain nitrogen fixing bacteria that do this process. There's also bacteria with nitrification. So different kinds of bacteria take the ammonia made through nitrogen fixation, turn it into nitrites, and then different bacteria turn it into nitrates. So you have to know these processes are done through bacteria. Okay, here's another vocab word for you, assimilation. It's basically when we take in nitrogen. So when humans or other animals eat nitrogen, that's how we assimilate it. Plants, when they take it up through the roots, that's assimilation for them. And then we release nitrogen in our waste products. So our poop and our pee has nitrogen as well. And then we, uh, well, humans, animals, plants die and are decomposed and the nitrogen returns to the soil. And so we have some other terms here. So um, when organic matter, a living thing, dies and is decomposed, it's called ammonification. It's also called mineralization. And then another process you need to know is called denitrification by other bacteria. And that is when the cycle completes and nitrogen is returned to the atmosphere. So we have here a figure and make sure that you in your books or in your notes, you really understand the different parts of the nitrogen cycle and can explain what is happening. You also need to memorize the terms for this cycle. So here is a list of our terms. You can pause the video just to go through them one more time. Note how bacteria do almost all of these processes. It's really important in the nitrogen cycle. Okay, here's a quick way to remember. As we call, um, this is an acronym that can help you remember the different um, stages of the nitrogen cycle. And then lastly, we need to understand how humans impact the nitrogen cycle. So nitrogen is a limiting factor. And so when we're growing our crops, our corn, our wheat, things that we eat, sometimes there's not enough nitrogen in the soil. So if we add nitrogen through fertilizers, then we can grow more crops on the same piece of soil. Now, sometimes the nutrients can leach they can leach, which means they can be taken out of the soil through water and end up in groundwater or run off into rivers and lakes. That is part of the human impact. We can also burn gasoline or diesel in our cars, which release nitric oxides into the atmosphere. And uh, so that's it for the nitrogen cycle.